Now, as we continue to talk about the church, uh, I, I want to uh, kind of go back to some basics. And I want to say, as I've said many times through the years, I love the church. It is the only institution that our Lord said He would build and bless. It is the one work of God in the world. The one redeeming work of God in the world through Christ is the establishing and building of the church. We started in Matthew where Jesus said, I will build My church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We love the church and we want the church to be the church in, in terms of its biblical definition. The church is chosen by God. It is a gathering of people who confess Jesus as Lord, who come together to worship God, to worship Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The church is the most precious thing that God possesses on earth. It is heaven come down. The church is precious because it was purchased by the blood of Christ. It is the earthly expression of heaven. It is the dwelling place of the Trinity. We are the temple of God. The church is the caretaker of the truth, as we saw last week, the pillar and support of the truth. The church is the purveyor of the gospel, the only message that saves sinners from eternal judgment. The church is salt and light having a preserving effect on the society around it. The church is the sole instrument of evangelism in this age. The church is the communion of saints which gives testimony to the power of the gospel by its joy and blessing and transformation uh, as the watching world views it. The church is this distinct group of redeemed people in the world. And the world is hostile to the church, but the world desperately needs the church. It is its only hope because it is the church that proclaims the message of salvation. Now as we look a little more closely at the church, we've sorted out some distinguishing marks of the church. Each of these could be a study and perhaps should be in itself. But we started last week with the first one, that the church is distinguished by its commitment to the absolute authority of Scripture. The second thing that characterizes the church is its commitment to worship, its commitment to worship. What do we mean by worship? We simply mean to give glory to God, to give honor to God, to give praise to God, to render obedience to God. And that starts with knowing God. We worship in spirit, but we also worship in truth. In spirit means with our hearts, with all our being. We love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or at least we desire to do that. And so we're talking, when we talk about spirit, we mean in the inner man. It's not that we're here to do some outward duty. We're not going through some symbolic emotions uh, or, or motions. We're not uh, doing some ceremonies or rituals or some perfunctory mechanical things. We come with a full heart of love directed at God. And that love shows up in our praise, in our singing, it shows up in our prayers, it shows up in our hearing the Word of God with joy and receiving it with obedience. All of that constitutes our worship. We are a worshiping people. To borrow the language of John 4 this morning, we worship in spirit and in truth because the Father seeks true worshipers. If we could define Christians in one word, it would be worshipers. And I mentioned this morning Philippians 3, 3, we worship in the power of the Spirit. We worship Christ and we have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, other language, maybe from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, "...and whatever you do, even when you eat and drink, do all to the glory of God." Everything a true worshiper does is to the glory of God. We give Him honor in everything. We defer to His will in everything. We obey His Word in everything. That's a worshiper. Worship rises to God from the heart of every true Christian because the Father seeks true worshipers and the Father makes true worshipers. We have been saved to be worshipers. And so the church of necessity by very definition is God-centered, is God-centered. We have been saved to be worshipers. The church cannot fulfill its mission and be man-centered. It must be God-centered. 
A couple of verses will put us in touch with this, and uh, there are many, but let me just uh, remind you of a couple that are somewhat familiar to you. Turn to Romans 12 for just a moment, that familiar opening of this twelfth chapter in Romans as Paul transitions out of the doctrinal section in 1 to 11 into the practical section. He defines essentially what Christians are called to do. Therefore, based upon all the great mercies of God, all, all the, the great aspects, features, elements of salvation which have occupied the first eleven chapters, every feature of salvation is explored in those previous chapters. And chapter eleven ends with this marvelous doxology about the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God and the unsearchable judgments and unfathomable ways of His. And all of it redounding to His glory at the end in verse 36, for from Him, through Him, to Him are all things, to Him be the glory forever, amen. That is the only possible expression of a true believer, worship. And naturally all of that section on salvation ends in a, in a doxology. We always say theology leads to doxology. And so based on all of that that has been granted to those who are in Christ, called by Paul in chapter 12, verse 1, the mercies of God. I urge you, brethren, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. That is worship, to present yourself, your body and all that is in it, to God as a holy sacrifice, a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a living one acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. We are worshipers, and our worship essentially means that we bow to God fully, that we offer up ourselves like a sacrifice on an altar, not a dead sacrifice, but a living one. And we do it in an acceptable way to God. That is our spiritual service of worship. And again, th th this is not to be mistaken, this is so plain and so obvious. The contrast is given in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. You you're stepping away from that. You don't bow to this world. You don't bend to this world. You don't submit to this world, but rather to God as your spiritual service of worship and be being transformed, literally says, by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove in your behavior what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What does it mean to worship? It means to offer yourself up totally to God as a spiritual act of worship, and that fleshes out by you not being conformed to the world, but rather conformed to the will of God. That is what is good and acceptable and perfect to Him. This is how we live our lives, in full submission to God as an act of worship. One other passage just to touch lightly on, 1 Peter 2, 5. Peter is describing what it is to be a believer here. He talks about us like babies who desire the pure milk of the Word. He doesn't mean we're spiritual babies. He means we desire the Word the way a baby desires milk. It's talking about the, the single desire of a believer is for the soul-feeding Word of God. And then he goes on further to talk about what it means to be a believer when he says in verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Your life is a sacrifice, and everything in your life is offered up as a sacrifice to God. You give Him everything, everything you are, everything you do, everything you possess, every experience, every trial, every positive event in your life, every discouraging event, it is all offered up to God. In a sense, you're saying, I submit it all to you, to your sovereign purpose and will, and I obey in everything. That's what it means to be a Christian. How can you question confessing Jesus as Lord if you just leave that language aside and look 
at the language of worship. We are worshipers. And by the way, that's what we're going to do forever in heaven, right? Revelation 4, Revelation 5, you can read them on your own, all about worship. And it's a picture of heaven, and all the angels and all the glorified saints are sitting around the throne of God and worshiping, 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 worshiping in what they say, and of course forever worshiping in what they do to serve God perfectly. The church then is a worshiping community of people. It is not man-centered. We don't come together uh, to give attention to ourselves. We don't come together to talk about ourselves. We don't come together to tweak our lives a little bit on a temporal level or a material level or a psychological level or a, level or a sociological level. We, we, we don't come together to figure out solutions to the problems of the planet. We're not a political group. We're not a lobby group. We are worshipers of the true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship with joy. We worship with love. That's what we do. So when you think about the life of the church, you have to realize that the church is committed to the absolute authority of Scripture, and it's committed to being a worshiping, a worshiping group. That's what we do. We worship with joy and love in the truth revealed in Scripture concerning the Trinity. Thirdly, and this is another very important component of life in the church. The church is committed to doctrinal clarity. The church is committed to doctrinal clarity. i got to be careful here because this is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, clarity is good, wouldn't you agree? Clarity is good. Anybody can be hard to understand. Sometimes you hear somebody say, well, I heard such and such speak, but it was over my head. Not really. No. D do you know why you couldn't understand? Because the speaker didn't understand. If it's not clear for you to understand it, it's not clear for him. It's very easy to be hard to understand. If you sort of pride yourself on being so, so uh, erudite that nobody understands you, the truth is you don't know what you're talking about. And one thing is for sure, if you don't get it, you can't make somebody else get it. Easy to be hard to understand. You just don't know what you're talking about and nobody else will. Very hard to be clear. Very demanding to be clear. That, that, that means you've got to go to the Word of God and you've got to apply the, the science of hermeneutics, the principles of interpretation to Scripture. You, you've got to work at it. You've got to study to be uh, d disciplined and to show yourself approved to God, a workman needing not to be ashamed. Uh, it takes great effort to understand the Word of God. You need to be like the noble Bereans who search the Scripture to see if certain things were so. But the church has the obligation to make doctrine clear. We're committed to the fact that God revealed Himself in His Word in such a way that we can understand it, that He used real language that means exactly what it says, real people, real history, real language, and you can interpret the Bible the exact same way you would interpret the Constitution of the United States or any other thing you read, any other docu document with the same reasonable approach. If you were to pin me down on what kind of Bible exposition that I'm committed to, I would say it's theological exposition. What I mean by that is sequential exposition that identifies theological truth and crystallizes that truth and passes it on to you. You understand that? It's not just telling the story in the narrative. It's pulling out the principle. I used to call it principalizing the Scripture, drawing out the doctrine that is there, crystallizing that doctrine, supporting that doctrine from other passages. You know as I preach that I'll be in a passage and I'll go somewhere else and I'll get a verse here and a verse there and a verse here. This is, uh, this is what theologians uh, in the Reformation called analogia scriptura. Analogia scriptura. The Scripture is analogous to itself. That is to say the Bible is the best source of explaining the Bible. Other passages explain every passage. It is consistent because it has one author. So we go through a passage and we draw out principles, and then I show you typically week after week, year after year, how this principle is further clarified and articulated in other places in Scripture. Now you have a doctrine. This is consistent with how the church has always functioned from its earliest days. In fact, this is what we mean by creed. 
You've heard about a creed, the Apostles' Creed, or a confession, the Westminster Confession, certain Baptist confessions or other kinds of confessions that have been identified through the centuries by groups of believers. What they have done is identified in Scripture propositional truth, propositional truth, revealed clear doctrine. And they've crystallized those doctrine. Uh, doctrines, and they've assembled those doctrines into creeds, and you even find some of them in the New Testament, such as the one we noted last time in um, Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, just after he talks about the church being the pillar and ground of the truth, he then gives the common confession, He who was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the Spirit, seen by angels proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory." Probably a hymn, but a creedal hymn concerning Christ. When all of this comes together, we call it systematic theology. Systematic theology, that is to say that you can put all the theology of Scripture together in a consistent system that is reasonable and non-contradictory because God is the author of all of it, and God is ultimate reason and cannot contradict Himself. Now, I don't need to beg the point any further except to say that when you get into the pastoral epistles, if, if I took the time, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, right? Pastoral epistles written from Paul to a pastor telling him about the church. Time after time after time, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, you hear this, sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. And doctrine is kind of a heady word, simply means teaching. But it speaks of a propositional truth, not about a style, it's, it's, it's about propositional truth, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. You get to Titus chapter 2, and um, we are instructed as those who have been given on the pages of Holy Scripture sound doctrine to teach it. But as for you, Titus 2, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. The chapter ends. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. Once you know truth, once you know propositional truth, once you know doctrine, you teach it with authority and you let no one disregard you. What is the word disregard? It's a, it, it's a word that simply means evade, get around you wiggle out. You have sound doctrine, you teach sound doctrine, and you let no one evade sound doctrine. All right, there's a fourth thing, and this is tied into it, that when you look at the life of the church, this is what you see or should see, uh, a commitment to the absolute authority of Scripture, a commitment to worship, doctrinal clarity. And I just need to say, uh, give a footnote to that. Every great ministry in the history of the church was founded on sound doctrine, not on experiences, not on feelings, not on emotions, not on sort of floating Bible verses, but sound doctrine. And here's, here's why. Because the fourth element of life in the church is spiritual discernment, spiritual discernment. The only people who are really discerning are people who have sound doctrine. The uniqueness of the church is that because we know what the Bible teaches, because we have doctrine that is sound, we can discern. We, we, we know how to measure everything. We know how to test everything. Now, this is, of course, a, a principle that appears in many places, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't have time to go back into the Old Testament. But listen, for example, to Colossians 1.9, "'For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding.'" Spiritual wisdom and understanding is discernment. And when, you, when you're filled with the knowledge of sound doctrine, you have discernment. You can sort out the things that are going on in the world. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This one will get a direct focus on the issue at hand. And we'll just look at verse 20. Do not despise prophetic utterances. 
And again, this is prophetic, not in the sense of predicting the future, but like a prophet, one who spoke for God. Don't despise those who speak for God. They're going to be out there. Don't despise them. However, verse 21, but examine everything and hold fast to that which is good and literally shun evil no matter what form it comes in, what form, what scheme, what system. That's the call for discernment. Be able to separate error from truth. When people ask me, what is the biggest problem in the church today? I will say that the biggest manifest problem is the utter lack of discernment. And it backs up to not having clear doctrine, which backs up to not submitting to the authoritative Word of God. What happens to people without theology, without discernment, they get caught up in emotion, mysticism, irrationality. They get led astray by false teachers. It is desperately critical for us to have our senses brought to a fine point, as Hebrews 5.14 says, so that we can discern good and evil. Don't despise preaching, but be able to see the truth and the error. Whatever is good, embrace it, cling to it, hold fast. Whatever evil, whatever scheme it might be, shun it, stay away from it. Spiritual discernment is critical. If you have spiritual discernment, you become a priceless person. You have answers. You understand. You can pass that on to the people you love, to your children, and to many others. The church is, is known for these four things, and one more I'll give you, the pursuit of holiness. We have been called, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In the language of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, God has called us to sanctification. The New Testament just makes so much of this. 1 Peter chapter 1, you might turn there, verse 11. Peter in verse 13 says, prepare your minds for action, keep sober, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. And then borrowing from Leviticus where it says this many times, you shall be holy for I am holy. In Ephesians 5. Again, we, we find familiar instruction along this line, therefore be imitators of God, be godlike, walk in love as Christ loved you and gave Himself up for us an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Immorality, any impurity, any greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. This kind of sin shouldn't even be named among us. And where it appears, Jesus said in Matthew 18, go to that person, confront that sin, call that brother to repent. If he doesn't repent, take two or three witnesses. If he still doesn't repent, send the church. And if he still doesn't repent, put him out. Put him out, Matthew 18. There should be no filthiness, no silly talk, coarse jesting, for you know this with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God? Why would you want to act like the people who aren't in the kingdom? You used to be darkness, verse 8, now you're light. Everything has changed. He goes on to talk about all of this all the way down in this wonderful chapter, even into marriage and relationships and families. The pursuit is always holiness. Now let's end where we started. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We started talking about worship and let's end there. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. This is how we worship. 
We worship with confidence. We enter into the holy place, the presence of God who inhabits His people's praise. He is here. We have confidence. We enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, the new covenant, which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. We're back to worship. Let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, and then this, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's coming with clean hands and a pure heart. To borrow the Old Testament psalm, pursuit of holiness, pursuit of holiness.